My Thomas Story Library, Trevor. This is a story about Trevor the Traction Engine. He was going to be broken up for scrap, but then he met Edward, who was determined to find his new friend a home. The Fat Controller works his engines hard, but they are very proud when he calls them really useful. I'm going to the scrapyard today, Edward called to Thomas. What? Already? You're not that old, replied Thomas cheekily. Thomas was only teasing. The scrapyard is full of rusty old cars and machinery. They are broken into pieces, loaded into trucks, and Edward pulls them to the steelworks, where they are melted down and used again. There was a surprise waiting for Edward in the yard. It was a traction engine. Hello, said Edward. You're not broken down and rusty. What are you doing here? I'm Trevor said the traction engine sadly. They're going to break me up next week. What a shame, said Edward. My driver says I only need some paint, polish and oil to be as good as new, continued Trevor. But my master thinks I'm old fashioned. Edward snorted. Some people think I'm old fashioned, but I don't care. The fat controller says I'm a useful engine. My Trevor says I'm useful too, said Trevor. Even if a job is hard, I don't give up, and I've never broken down in my life. What work did you do? asked Edward. My master would send us from farm to farm, Trevor replied. We thrashed corn, hauled logs, and did lots of other work. The children loved to see us. Trevor shut his eyes, remembering. I miss the children, he sighed. Edward set off for the station. Broken up, what a shame. Broken up, what a shame, he clanked. I must help Trevor, I must. Edward thought of his Edward thought of all his friends who liked engines, but he knew none of them would have room for a traction engine at home. It's a shame, it's a shame, he hissed. As Edward pulled into the station, there, standing on the platform, was the vicar. Hello, Edward. You look upset, he said. What's the matter, Charlie? He asked Edward's driver. There's a traction engine in the scrapyard, vicar, the driver replied. He'll be broken up next week. Jem Cole says he's never driven a better engine. Do save him, sir, said Edward. He's a very useful engine. He can carry wood and give children rides. We'll see, replied the vicar. Jem Cole came to the scrapyard on Saturday. The Reverend is coming to see you, Trevor, he said. Maybe he'll buy you. Do you think he will? asked Trevor hopefully. He will when I've licked your fire and cleaned you up, Jem told him. The vicar and his two boys arrived that evening. Show us what you can do, Trevor, said the vicar. Trevor chuffered around the yard. He hadn't felt so happy for months. Later, the vicar came out of the office smiling. Trevor is coming home with me, Jem, he said. Did you hear that, Trevor? said Jem. The Reverend has, the Reverend has saved you and you'll live at the vicarage now. Peep, peep, whistled Trevor happily. Now Trevor's home is in the vicarage orchard and he sees Edward every day. His paint is spotless and his brass shines like gold. Trevor likes his work, but his happiest day is the church fate. With a wooden seat bolted to his bunker, he chuffers around the orchard, giving rides to children. Long afterwards, you will see him shut his eyes, remembering. I like being with children again, he whispers happily. My Thomas Story Library, Bertie. This is a story about Bertie the Bus. 
Bertie and Thomas both think they can go fastest. They just can't agree, so they decided to have a race to settle the argument once and for all. One day, Thomas was waiting at the junction when a bus came into the yard. Hello, said Thomas. Who are you? I'm Bertie. Who are you? I'm Thomas. I run this branch line. Ah, I remember now, said Bertie. You were stuck in the snow. I took your passengers and Terence the Cracker pulled you out. I've come to help you with your passengers today. Help me, said Thomas crossly. I don't need any help. Anyway, I can go faster than you. You can't, said Bertie. I can, huffed Thomas. I'll raise you, said Bertie. Their drivers agreed to the race. Are you ready? said the station master. Go! And they were off. Thomas always had to start off slowly, and Bertie was soon ahead of him. But Thomas didn't... But Thomas didn't hurry. Why don't you go fast? Why don't you go fast? called Annie and, Cl called Annie and Clarabelle anxiously. Wait and see, wait and see, hissed Thomas. He's a long way ahead, a long way ahead, they wailed. But Thomas didn't mind, he remembered the level crossing. Bertie was there, waiting impatiently at the gates, while Thomas and his carriages went sailing through. Goodbye Bertie, called Thomas. After that, the road left the railway, so Thomas, Annie and Clarabelle couldn't see Bertie. Then they had to stop at a station to let some passengers off. Peep, 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 quickly please, called Thomas. Everybody got out quickly, the guard blew his whistle, and off they went again. Come along, come along, sang Thomas. We're coming along, we're coming along, sang Annie and Clarabelle. Hurry, 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 panted Thomas. Then he looked ahead and saw Bertie crossing the bridge over the railway, tooting triumphantly on his horn. Oh dearie me, oh dearie me, groaned Thomas. Steady, Thomas, said his driver. We'll beat Bertie yet. We'll beat Bertie yet. We'll beat Bertie yet, echoed Annie and Clarabelle. We'll do it. We'll do it, panted Thomas. Oh, bother. There's a station. As Thomas stopped, he heard a toot. Goodbye, Thomas, called Bertie. You must be tired. Sorry I can't stop. We bosses have to work, you know. Goodbye. The next station was by the river. They got there quickly, but the signal was up. <sighs> oh dear, thought Thomas, we've lost. But at the station, he had a drink of water and felt much better. Then the signal dropped. Hurrah, we're off! Hurrah, we're off! puffed Thomas happily. As Thomas crossed the bridge, he heard an impatient toot toot. There was Bertie, waiting at the traffic lights. But as soon as the lights changed, Bertie started with a roar and chased after Thomas. Now Thomas reached his full speed. Bertie tried hard, but Thomas was too fast. Whistling joyfully, he plunged into the tunnel, leaving Bertie far behind. I've done it! I've done it! panted Thomas. We've done it, hooray! We've done it, hooray! chanted Annie and Clarabelle as they whooshed into the last station. The passengers all cheered loudly. When Bertie came in, they also gave him a big welcome. Well done, Thomas, said Bertie. That was fun. But I would have to grow wings like an aeroplane to beat you over that hill. Thomas and Bertie now keep each other busy. Bertie finds people who want to travel by train and takes them to Thomas, while Thomas brings people to the station for Bertie to take home. They often talk about their race, but Bertie's passengers don't like being bounced around like peas in a pan, and the back controller has told Thomas not to race at dangerous speeds. So although, between you and me, they would like to have another race, I don't think they ever will. Do you?
My Thomas Story Library, Diesel. This is a story about Diesel the Diesel Engine. He played tricks on other engines so no one liked working with him. But when Thomas got into trouble, would Diesel come to his rescue? One day, Percy wasn't feeling well. His joints ached and he couldn't breathe properly. The Fat Controller came to inspect him. You need to go to the works to be repaired, he said. I'll have to get another engine to do your work until you're better. The Fat Controller phoned other railways to see if anyone could spare an engine. But the only, but the only available engine was Diesel. The Fat Controller didn't want to use Diesel because the last time he had worked at his station, he had caused so much trouble that he had been sent away in disgrace. But as no other engine could help out, Diesel had to do. The next day, Diesel came to the station to collect the troublesome trucks. Thomas was not happy to see him because Diesel had played so many tricks on him before. Take these trucks to the harbour, Thomas said, but don't play any silly tricks, he warned him. Yes, Thomas, of course I won't play tricks. I'll do whatever I'm told, Diesel said slyly. The troublesome trucks teased Diesel. Yes, Thomas, of course I won't play tricks. I'll do whatever I'm told, they said in Diesel's voice. Diesel was angry. I'll take you, he roared and bumped into them roughly, sending them flying into a siding. The trucks crashed through the buffers and slid off the track. Diesel hadn't meant the trucks to crash. He had only wanted to scare them. But he still wanted them to do as they were told. So he said, That will teach you to laugh at me! The Fat Controller was disappointed with Diesel. You will go back to the other railway as soon as I can arrange it, he said sternly. I won't have trouble on my railway. After such a severe telling off, Diesel was glad to be going home. A few days later, Daisy was going up a hill when she felt something splash against her wheels. When she stopped at the next station, she felt hot and her joints were stiff. You've lost your oil, her driver said. Bertie can take your passengers while we get you repaired. Thomas had to go over the hill where Daisy had spilt her oil. He was halfway up when his wheel started slipping on the oil. Suddenly, Thomas, Annie and Clarabel slipped back down the hill. As they reached the bottom, Clarabel's wheels bounced off the main track onto an unfinished siding. Her front wheels fell off the end of the track and sank into the mud. Thomas was left stranded across the main track. Diesel was at the next station waiting to go home. He laughed when he heard what ha he laughed when he heard what had happened, but then he realized Thomas was blocking the track so he couldn't get past. Bother! Diesel said crossly. I'll have to I'll have to help Thomas or I can't get home. Workmen cleaned the oil off the tracks, then they put sand on them to help Diesel grip them. Diesel moved slowly forward and was coupled to Thomas. Wooden railway, sleeper, wooden railway sleepers were put under Clarabelle's wheels so she could be pulled back onto the rails. Thank you for coming to help, Diesel, said Thomas. We would have been stuck here all day. Diesel gripped the sanded rails and pulled with all his strength. Slowly and carefully, he pulled Thomas, Annie and Clarabelle back onto the main track. Well done, Diesel, said Thomas. You have been a really useful engine. Diesel smiled. It felt good to be helpful for a change instead of always causing trouble. Diesel carefully pulled Thomas, Annie and Clarabel over the slippery hill and onto the Fat Controller station. Good work, Diesel, said the Fat Controller. 
You've been so helpful today that I am happy for you to come back to work at my station. Diesel smiled. He was pleased that he was going home, but he was also glad that he could come back again to work for the Fat Controller. My Thomas Story Library, Daisy. This is a story about Daisy the Diesel Railcar. She worked at my station while Thomas was being repaired. She was bossy and thought she always knew best, but she soon learned not to be so bullish. One day, when Thomas was being repaired, the Fat Controller brought Daisy to work at the station. Look at me, she said to the passengers. I'm highly sprung and right up to date. After travelling with me, you won't want to ride in Thomas's bumpy carriages again. The passengers climbed aboard and waited for Daisy to set off. Every morning, milk was collected from the farm and put on a wagon at the station. The wagon was coupled to Thomas's first train of the day, so he would take it to the dairy. That day, the milk wagon was waiting for Daisy. I won't take that, she said in horror. Nonsense, said her driver. Come on now, it won't take long. But Daisy refused to move. Daisy lied so she wouldn't have to take the wagon. My fitter says I'm highly sprung and pulling is bad for my swerves, she said. I can't understand it, said a workman. Whatever made the fat controller send us such a feeble... <laughs> feeble? Spluttered Daisy crossly. Stop arguing, cried the passengers. We're late already. Nothing Daisy's driver nor guard said would change her mind. So Workman moved the milk wagon and Daisy went smugly away. I made up a clever story, she chuckled to herself. Now I can do all... Now I can do the jobs I want to do, and no more. When Toby came to the station, he was surprised to see the milk wagon there. Daisy's left the milk, Percy said crossly. Now I'll have to make a special journey with it, and I'm already late for the quarry. Why don't I take the milk to the dairy, and you fetch my quarry trucks, said Toby said. That way, we can both save time. It was agreed, and both engines set off. A little later, Toby met Daisy at the... A little later, Toby met Daisy at a junction. She laughed at his side plates and cow catches. Toby explained that he had them to stop animals being hurt if they got... If they got on the track in front of him. You're just scared, Daisy said rudely. If I see an animal on the track, I'll toot and it will move. I'm not scared, Toby replied calmly, and they won't just move if you toot. They will with me, said Daisy proudly. When Daisy reached the next station, a policeman waited for her to stop. Champion the bull is on the track, he said. Please move him along to the farmer. I'll show Toby how to manage animals, Daisy said to her driver, but she was about to be surprised. Move on, tooted Daisy when she saw the bull, but Champion didn't move. After a while, he became curious and slowly walked towards Daisy. Ooh, said Daisy nervously. Look at his big horns. If I bump into them, he might hurt, uh, himself. She quickly backed away and left. Meanwhile, Percy had picked up Toby's trucks. He was still grumpy about Daisy, so he was rude to the trucks. The trucks decided to teach him a lesson. When he pulled them over a big hill, they shoved him forward, sending him racing out of control. Help! Percy cried as he as he flew through a level crossing and crashed into some stone trucks in the yard. Toby was leaving the station when Daisy crept back. One of her passengers told him what had happened. 
Now you know why my Cyplex and cow catchers are so useful. Toby chuckled. Just then, a workman told them about Percy's crash. If you help Percy, Toby said to Daisy, I'll take your passengers and move the bull. Daisy agreed and both engines set off. Daisy worked hard all afternoon. She moved all the stone trucks away from the track so the breakdown train could rescue Percy. The fat controller came to speak to Daisy. I heard that you left the milk wagon, he said crossly. I won't have lazy engines working on my railway. However, you have done a good job. However, you have done a good job here, so if you promise to work hard and listen to the other engines, you can stay on. Thank you, sir said Daisy humbly. Thomas came back to work the next day. Daisy stayed on to help while Percy was being repaired. The fat controller was very pleased because she had worked hard and listened to the other engines. Daisy became good friends with the engines and sometimes she even delivered the milk wagon for Thomas. My Thomas Story Library, Spencer. This is a story about Spencer. With a sleek shape and silver paint, Spencer thinks that he is a very splendid engine indeed. But my engines showed him that when it comes to getting jobs done, it is hard work that really counts. One day, the Duke and Duchess came to Sodor for a visit. Gordon hoped that he would have the special job of showing the important visitors around the island. But, to Gordon's disappointment, the Duke and Duchess brought their own engine with them. His name was Spencer, and he was the shiniest, sleekest engine that Gordon had ever seen. That afternoon, there was to be a party at Marin Station for the Duke and Duchess. That's on the other side of Gordon's Hill, James told Spencer. You'll need to take on plenty of water. Gordon added helpfully. I have plenty of water, wished Spencer as he steamed out of the yard. But when Spencer reached Gordon's hill, he began to struggle. The hill was long and steep. He puffed, he panted, he pulled with all his might. But Spencer had run out of steam. His driver had to phone for help. Back at the station, the station master told Gordon, the fat controller has a job for you. There's an engine stuck on a hill. Gordon set off at once. Gordon was surprised to find Spencer. What's wrong? He asked. No water, snapped Spencer. I must have a leaky tank. Perhaps, smiled Gordon, but we'd better hurry. Everyone is waiting for the Duke and Duchess. Soon Gordon was coupled up to Spencer and they set off. Minutes later, they arrived at Marin Station. The party was ready to begin. Well done, Gordon, said the fat controller. You are a very useful engine. Gordon glowed with pride. Spencer was a very fast engine. One day, when he pulled into Knapford Station, his driver had exciting news for him. You have beaten Gordon's record, he said. Of course, boasted Spencer. I'm faster and finer than all the engines on Sodor put together. The fat controller's engines were very cross. Spencer was taking the Duke and Duchess to their summer house. The fat controller came to tell his engines that one of them was needed to carry their furniture. The engine saw the chance for a race. Please, sir said Thomas, James and Gordon all together. May I go? But the fat controller told Edward to go instead. James and Gordon groaned. Edward was an old engine and not as strong and fast as the others. He'll lose the race and let the whole railway down, said James. Thomas and Percy were cross with James. Edward was their friend. You can beat that big silver show off any day, they told him. Slowly and steadily, Edward set off. We'll do my best, we'll do my best, he puffed. But Spencer quickly passed Edward. 
I've won already, he boasted, and with a whoosh, he was gone. Edward came to the bottom of a steep hill. The furniture was heavy, and he felt tired. But Donald and Douglas were waiting at the junction. They had heard about the race. Hurry for Edward, cried Donald. He is a first-rate engine, added Douglas. This made Edward feel much better. He huffed and puffed, and soon he had climbed to the top of the hill. He raced down the other side to catch up with Spencer. Spencer happily steamed along. Up ahead was the siding leading to the summer house. But the Duke wanted to take but the Duke wanted to take some photographs of the countryside. Spencer stopped, and the Duke set up his camera. Spencer closed his eyes. Nothing to worry about, he said lazily. Before long, Spencer was fast asleep. When the Duke had finished taking photographs, Spencer's driver rang the bell. Time to go, he said. Nothing happened. Spencer was dreaming of winning the race. He didn't hear the bell, and he didn't hear Edward puffing past him. Spencer's driver rang the bell again and again. Finally, Spencer opened his eyes. He couldn't believe what he saw. Edward was heading towards the summer house. Nearly there, nearly there, gasped the old engine. Spencer took off as fast as he could, but he was too late. Edward pulled to a stop in front of the summer house. I've won, he gasped. I did it. Suddenly, his pistons didn't ache and his axles weren't shaking. Edward felt like the pride of the Sodor Railway. And he was right. <laughs>